Hello, everybody. This is Corsair Mack, president of the Illinois Mental Health Counselors Association. And today I'm joined by our very own special guest, Chelsea Keaton. How are you doing today? I am fantastic. How are you? I am doing good. I am doing good. Made it back from church. It is pretty much almost 50 degrees here. It's Surprisingly, so it's been so cold lately. Yeah. And the Super Bowl's tonight, so I'm pretty excited. Yeah, I'm not watching the Super Bowl at all. I didn't even remember it was the Super Bowl until someone told me about it. I was like, ooh, I got to see Rihanna. But yes, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so beautiful outside. I got to walk my dog, and it's their first walk of the year. And so she was just elated, but it's so nice. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Got to watch Rihanna, too. I am so excited. She came back. Thank goodness. Uh, mm -hmm, exactly. All right, so we'll go ahead and jump right in it because all your fans want to know. How did you become interested in counseling? Oh my gosh. So um, for starters, um, I, so I went to Northern Illinois University. I got my bachelor's degree and my master's degree um, from there. And so it started in undergrad, undergrad. And when I went to NIU, I was like, all right, I'm going to be an attorney. I'm going to get into like, you know, their law school. I had no, I just, cause it sounded good, right? I want to be an attorney cause it sounded good. They had a law school. And I heard it was good. Um, and then I took a political science course and I correlated political science and law school. And I'm like, I don't like this at all. This is very boring. It's not fun. And then I'm like, all right, cool. Let me try business. I didn't really like business. Um, and then I stumbled into, I don't even remember how I stumbled into it, but I stumbled into the, the, the major family and child studies. Um, and I think I stumbled into it because I took one of their classes like as an elective and I love people. I love understanding the mind. I love understanding kind of like why people do some of the things that they do. Um, and so I stumbled into that major and I specifically chose the track in that major that was going to require a, an internship because I was like, if I have the option to do an internship, I might choose not to do it. And I don't want to give myself an out. I want to just do it. So my, um, my internship was at a counseling center. It was part of the, for those familiar with the NIU community, Sycamore DeKalb, it was, um, it was like the Kishwaukee Hospital. I think it's still called Kishwaukee, um, the Hospital Outpatient Counseling Center. Um, and that experience was so transformative. I've never, I've never, um, I've never been to therapy in my life. Um, well, not currently, but not back then. Um, I never been to therapy. I didn't really, I didn't really understand therapy. I didn't really know what I was going to be experiencing other than like what I saw on TV. And I had a friend who actually was in the um, counseling program at NIU at the time. So I heard glimpses of what she was talking about, but I didn't really know. And so when I got there, it was so cool because it was a multidisciplinary practice. So my supervisor, my direct supervisor was an LCPC like me. Then we had an LMFT, we had a social worker, we had a psych nurse, and there were two psychologists. Um, and there was um, two psychiatrists. So I got to experience everything. And it was, I, <laughs> realistically, when I walked away from there, I'm like, I want the boss's job. I want her job. She was the director and she... Um, she was the LCPC and she, um, she did therapy and she also did all the, you know, administrative stuff because well, she's the boss. Um, but I just loved how she, uh, I loved how she, um, practiced. I love the relationship that she had with her clients. And I just, just to witness that was just so cool. It was so cool. And, um, they helped me kind of figure out what I wanted to do for grad school um, I was really kind of like gung ho for the marriage and family therapy program at NIU. Um, and that was a really, really great program. They accept very few people a year. It's like 12 people a year. Um, I apply. Yeah. It's like, it was, yeah. And, um, I did not get accepted and I was a little hurt. Yeah. Right. Um, I did not get accepted, but I did also apply to the counseling program at NIU. Um, and I was accepted to that. And so just like learning about prior to um, getting accepted to the program, because we had to go through the PAW, the PAW is like a very intense interview process um, um, to get into that program. But my friend who was in the program, she was telling me about it and just how transformative it was for her and how reflective that experience was for her and how it's really changing her as a person. 
And then also in talking to um, the colleagues who were at my internship, they're like, yeah, you could do a very specialized track. You could do LMFT or I didn't really know much about social work at the time. So that wasn't really an option, but I could have done all of those things. But they're like, being an LCPC, you have some options. You can do just as much and it's just as good. Um, and so that is the beginning of my counseling journey. Um, and that's how I became interested in it. And yeah, life-changing that year. Oh yeah, 100%. I did not know you did not get into the LMFT program. I am sorry, geez. It must have had a really strong process there. Yeah, like, I don't know how they, how they are anymore, but like either 12 people a year, if I misspeak, and I, you folks, I'm sorry, but I feel like I was told or I read because I was really, like I said, it was gung-ho, um, like at least like 12, maybe to 15 people like a year or like a semester. Like it was, it was rigid. Um, but yeah, it wasn't meant to be apparently and that's okay. Not sure it wasn't meant to be, but that was great because now you're here talking with me and an LCPC. So life mm -hmm. always finds a way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, it's funny, like when I, like, I don't know if I was in, in my mind, like an LMFT and maybe I thought this when I was early grad school days, getting the LCPC degree, I was like, I'm going to be like the therapist to the rich and famous. And <laughs> I'm going to be making a lot of money. I'm going to have this cute office and it's going to be, all I was really romanticizing, like the field right and so I think that's part of why like part of why I wanted to do LMFT because in my mind I'm going to just work with the rich folks who have marital problems I'm going to be their therapist the rich celebrities or athletes or whatnot right which can still happen it's not really a goal I don't really care at this point I love my people <laughs> somehow that that thought process was in there I don't know <laughs> awesome and also for those of you guys that don't know Chelsea and I, we have a little bit of background together because we were both actually in the same grad school program together. And if I don't think we went through the PAW, which is a pre-admission workshop, but I know we were in the same program going through it. So I know you mentioned for undergrad and grad school, you went to NIU. So that kind of took away the second question. So I'm going to ask you a little bit of a surprise question. Don't worry, nothing Ooh. bad, I promise. What I'm would you ready. say is your favorite class during grad school? Favorite class? I have two. Can I do two? Mm -hmm. One of them was a more experiential class. Um, let me think. Is this accurate? Let's think. Yeah. So my first class that I'd say that I liked the most was practicum because practicum stretched me, right? Um, I'd say practicum and group are kind of on the same because group introduced me to therapy in general because in group in our group class we learned group theory i think no not group theories just like how to facilitate like therapy groups we had to participate as part of the class in a therapy group and i had never done that and it was cool was so cool i love therapy y'all it's so fun so cool um so that was like my introduction and i really loved it and then also practicum stretched me because i was scared i was very scared to be the expert in the room with these people and their lives and their problems. And, and I'm not a real professional yet. I'm a practicing professional. So it's like, I hope I do good. I hope I don't like screw somebody up. Um, but I didn't, I hope. Um, but, I, <laughs> but I did not. Um, and I grew a lot in my confidence in that class. Like my confidence went way up and I just kind of learned, I think it was, that class and the other one that I'm about to mention where I learned that I am most effective when I am being myself. And so when I can allow my personality to show in any setting, I'm, I know I'm going to be effective. I know that that rapport is going to be there. I know that I'm going to be able to alleviate whatever anxiety, worry, imposter syndrome that I have, because I got this, right? So that goes into my second favorite class, which is was um it was the uh what was it it was mm, it was the career teaching class did you teach oh no i didn't teach okay so it, i think it was like uh like a section of the career planning course i think because we all had to take a career course oh yeah the um, yes 
Um, but there was um, an, an option for us to be able to teach and it was still a class, um, but we taught about um, career planning and career, career exploration. And again, that class stretched me because I was super scared and I was super scared to talk in front of people. But I'm like, wow, what a great experience. I get to teach, I get to practice teaching and I get credit for it. Um, and so at first we started with two instructors, but people um, withdrew or maybe the class this is for too big. And then it went down to one instructor. And then I was just like shaking in my boots. I didn't have on boots cause it was summer, but y'all get it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I was so scared cause I'm like, oh my God, I, I'm in charge of a class by myself. Um, and, but I didn't have a choice cause I had already signed up for it. And that's part of why I signed up for it. Cause I knew once I'm in, I'm in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to show up. And so that class, despite all of my anxiety and my worry, like, will I, will I sound smart enough? Will I be organized enough? Will these students know what I'm talking about? Um, I did really well and I enjoyed it. It was so much fun. So yes, it was, it stretched me and I was scared. But by the end of that class, like I had built like wonderful relationships with my students. Um, I think we had fun together. I think I learned a lot of valuable things and I hope they learned a lot of valuable things. And so, yes, those are the two classes that stick out the most, the most to me because of how much I grew and how much fun they were. All right, yeah. very nice. Yeah. A lot of knowledge and wisdom there. I love it. All right, yeah. perfect. That wasn't even a knowledge or wisdom question. So the teacher mm -hmm. is coming out of you naturally. I try, I try. I do like to educate people. I love, I, <laughs> So if you follow me on social media, which I can share at some point, if you talk to me and just like most of the people in my real life know my life outside of right this setting, know that like I just love talking about mental health. Um, part of like, kind of backtracking a little bit to how I became interested in counseling. One of the things that maintained my interest was I remember learning about our like emotions. We did a lot of reflection, right? And I remember being starting to learn how to put a face to the name of the things that I was feeling, right? And that was like, like mind blowing, right? Because I remember being a kid and being socially anxious or insecure. And like, I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't even know what it was called. I didn't know that there was something that I could do with the things that I felt and the things that I was thinking, right? I just, I don't know. I just thought it was. And I remember thinking that like, I wish, I can't wait a matter of fact, to be able to share with people the things that I wish I knew when I was younger, right? Like I wish, and so that's that educational piece. I use a lot of, a lot of personal example and how I do therapy um, and how I teach people and how I educate. Um, I, 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 know, I guess I'm rambling at this point, but I, I, I always go back to that feeling of like, wow, I wish I knew this when I was 18, 17, going through that breakup doing that presentation and my hands were shaking, right? I didn't recognize that they were breathing techniques and whatnot. So yeah, education is, is I went on a little tangent there, but education is like a big deal to me. I love it oh, and it's fun. Oh, I believe it. Never again for me, but this isn't my interview, right? This is your interview. <laughs> 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 All right, so you take these classes, right? And then, you know, you keep going, you keep plugging away, you keep chugging along, and then eventually, boom, you graduate, right? You're out there in the real world. So how long have you been doing therapy for? Well, what is it, 2023? Mm -hmm. I graduated, I graduated in 2015, December of 2015. So what is that like? Is that eight years? Yeah. Eight years. And that's like not including like internship experience. And I count that because well, like it's clinical work. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna round it up and say about a decade I've been in this space of therapy and practicing. Oh, wow, yeah. very nice. It's I wild even got to my say. practicum too. Mm -hmm, right. mm -hmm. Yep, then yep, it's been a decade because I, I started in 2013. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. The time sure has flown, hasn't it? Sure has. <laughs> Pleasantly reminded my daughter just turned five and I'm like, I have a five-year-old? Like, how did this even happen? Like, she was just five pounds. Now she's 40 pounds, right? For, like, perspective shift. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what a time. But yes, 10 yeah. years ago. All right. So, well, first, 
happy, I don't know if it's pre or post, well, I guess post birthday now to your daughter since she's five. All right, so now hope you can impart some of that experience on us with this next question I'm about to ask you. So what places did you work starting off in your profession and what did you learn as a result from working at those places? Yeah, okay. So interestingly, so I, so I did my, let's go back to when I was still in grad school. Um, and so part of our graduate program required an internship. And so I got an internship um, at a place in my hometown called Stepping Stones of Rockford. Um, I'm from Rockford, Illinois. And um, I, that, um, that population um, was really, really cool. Um, I was working with um, um, adults who um, suffer from severe and persistent mental illness. So those were individuals who weren't really able to do a lot of life tasks on their own without assistance. And so it was literally like stepping stones for lack of better words, it's the name of the organization. And so there are like individuals who like lived, um, they had like different apartment buildings. They had some people who did some like independent living, like they had their own apartment, but like they would still kind of get like some interaction with like a case manager. Um, and so I was doing that work. And so in my internship, I was trying to do some individual therapy. Um, I think group therapy was more effective a lot of the individuals maybe had a lot of like um, active like delusion or um, um, they weren't necessarily, I, I don't think individual therapy was really the best uh, fit for that population, but I was able to check in with the clients, just kind of talk like, how you doing? What are your feelings? And that type of stuff. And then we did a lot of group therapy. Um, and so I, I mentioned that to say they hired me um, after I graduated, I think I applied for like a, maybe like a manager, a case manager or something like that, or a program manager, or they hired me as a program manager and I wanted to be like a, like a director. So I'd be over like my own apartment, um, like my own apartment um, complex, I guess, for lack of better words. Mm -hmm. um, Cause each one focused on different things. Like there was teenage girls, there was, I think maybe teenage boys. There were some adults. Um, there were like the elderly in one setting. And so um, I, I started out doing case management before I applied for the director position. Ooh, I hated case management so much, so much. It is not for me, bless the people who do it. It's not like helping people manage their budgets, um, freaking helping them with their medication and just like the real tedious stuff, checking on people, making sure they're up to, you know, did you take a shower today? You got to make it to group. Do you, they got, do you have food and groceries? And it was just, um, it was not, it was not for me. Um, and I found myself like working, like I would go into work at like eight o'clock and I wouldn't leave work till like six, seven. Cause it was, it took me a long time to do it. Like I just, my brain wasn't wired for it. Like I didn't feel like I was effective. Um, I don't necessarily think it questioned me to smart, to, question how like smart I was or anything like that but I just was like I didn't like it um I was grateful for my job because it was in Rockford it was five minutes from my mom's house I was living at my, with my mom at the time um uh, it's like my first big girl job um and so I three months into there they had they had um I want to say they had just either chosen me to, as a director because I um I applied and I, I interviewed and they wanted to hire me in that um, I ended up turning them down because I then, um, in the process of me working for them as a case manager, I was also applying to other jobs um, because I'm a new graduate and that's, you know, what new graduates do. You apply for various, you know, jobs elsewhere just to see. Um, so I applied for a job, the job that I um, currently am in now um, with Liberty Healthcare. Um, and that was way downstate um, in a little town called Rushville. And me being from Rockford, I'm like, Rushville must be a Chicago suburb. All right, let's. <laughs> it's clearly a Chicago suburb. Like, why would anybody else? There is no place else in Illinois other than the Chicago land area. I knew no better. Um, so I get a call from this company, and they're telling me about. I had just accepted the position as a as a director of you know of, of the program or something like that, and um, I get a call from this company, and they're like, "Yeah, blah blah, blah. you submitted an application." this is kind of what we do, blah, blah, blah. And I almost was getting ready to say, no, thank you. I just accepted a job. But then I was like, well, what is your pay range? And they're like, we're starting at this dollar amount. And that was 
$20,000 more than what I was making at the current place. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll come down for an interview. That was in, I think that might have been in January of 2016. It was in January of 16, January, February of 2016. I went down there for an interview down to the facility. This is an inpatient facility. This is the beginning of my forensic work that we'll get into. Um, it's an inpatient uh, detention facility um, that is kind of built like a prison, um, but I won't get into the details of that. Um, but uh, so I went out there with a five hour interview. It's very holistic, very, very holistic. Yeah, um, just me all bright eyed and bushy tailed. Um, I, you know, I interviewed with one group of um, of individuals who are like team leads over different clinicians, another group of individuals who are team leads over clinicians. I got to meet with a clinician who had worked there, who was a seasoned clinician. And then I got a tour of the facility and then they took me out to lunch and I was exhausted. And then I got a ticket on my way home. Well, that was kind of a bummer. Oh, yeah, <laughs> on my way back to Rockford, I got a ticket. Um, I think it was in Moline, Illinois or something like that. Nonetheless, um, I, uh, Let's see, what did I learn as a result? So what, where did I start off working in my career? That's how, that's how I got started. So my first job was Stepping Stones, working with a severely mentally ill population. It was a really great group. I have a lot of compassion for that population. And then I started working with Liberty Healthcare. Um, I knew I had, and so specifically with Liberty Healthcare, um, those, those clients are um, um, sexual offenders. So those are individuals who have committed sexual offenses. Um, and my, one of my licenses is licensed sex offender treatment provider. And so since I began working down there, I have been licensed to work with that specific population. Yeah. Did I miss any questions? I was just going. <laughs> oh, no, that was perfect. No, that yeah, was great. Okay. Okay. okay you learned a lot. <laughs> right? Yeah, I did. When I, when I think about it, when I start talking like, out loud, I'm like, all right, these last eight years have been a journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So speaking of this journey, right, as we all know, this month is Black History Month. So yeah. I mean, true, you know, a lot of different things that are being talked about and things that I interview people about, especially clinicians, of, excuse me, clinicians of color or Black and Latinx especially, true, I believe it shouldn't just be tailored or honed in to one specific month. This is something that we need to talk about all the time. But Hopefully, now that we're here talking about it, right, you can impart some of your knowledge and wisdom onto us. So what was your experience as a Black woman and a Black clinician working in the counseling field? Um, I think one word that can sum it up is probably isolating. It can be very isolating. Um, it honestly still is. Like, I think so right now I work also in addition to the forensic work that I do, I work in a private practice with another colleague from NIU, Melissa Carlson. Um, but that's probably, and we're all virtual, so we don't we don't really see each other face to face, but that is probably the most diverse group of clinicians that I've worked with in my entire career. And so there's four black clinicians, uh, maybe I think four or five, but it's been isolating. And so backtracking a little bit when I was working downstate and currently with the forensic work that I do, because now I do outpatient, I don't do, I don't work in the detention facility anymore. Um, I have, I'm usually always the only black person. There might be at, from the state, it's a statewide program, right? So we work with the Department of Human Services. Um, so Illinois Department of Human Services. So it's like statewide. Uh, and it was just, there's just not a lot of black clinicians there in when I in my duration downstate at the at the detention facility um I was maybe there for like two years um there was always maybe one or two other black clinicians and so whenever I got a chance to work with another clinician of color it would be kind of like this unspoken like you know after you like if we need to kind of vent to each other um or just connect with each other uh, because it how do i say this central illinois can be um, not the most culturally competent environment for lack of better words um and it and it shows and you can feel it as a person of color especially when you start to go more rural um 
And so there were things that we would see within the within that facility. We were things that we would we would maybe experience in our own lives, you know, outside or living around that facility. Um, you know, experiencing racial microaggressions um, amongst staff members, sometimes with clientele, um, experiencing. I won't. I don't think there was any. There's no overt racism that comes to mind, but there was just a lot of need for cultural competence in that in that facility. Um, there was an opportunity for me to. I almost did kind of host some type of cultural training, but it just never ended up working out. Um, it was always my vision, and it still is a vision. Going back to like training, it's always been a vision for me to like I like go into companies or you know just different environments and breaking them down into small groups where we're able to have like real kind of in-depth conversation about like some of the kind of the, the deep stuff of cultural competence of racial microaggressions of un, um, unconscious bias or and stuff like that and how because sometimes I think when 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 they bring in someone to talk about cultural competence to train not train because they're really training um, but to train people like it's very surface level and while some people may be impacted and in, in, in um you know they're able to reflect and they take something home it tends to kind of stay within the work environment and i think that it's not just work right it's it's work it's home like that bleeds into every part of your life and so my vision when I was when I was downstate and wanting to do this training, and I still want to create this training, I just life happens and I haven't gotten a chance to do it. I would like to be able to maybe like a, a in depth workshop where we're looking at ourselves and we're becoming vulnerable and we're looking at how we can change ourselves so we can change our environment, our work environment, because it starts with us personally. It's not just something that okay, let me just turn it on at work, you know. So. Um, to sum it up, it, it's, it's, I'm, unfortunately, I'm used to it. I'm used to being the only Black person. Like right now in my office, I'm, I wasn't the only Black person. We had another Black clinician recently, um, but she explored career options elsewhere. But it just kind of always is what it is. Whenever I see another Black person who works there, we always try to connect and make sure we have a good relationship because that's important to me. Um, so, yeah. Hopefully things change in the field and we get more clinicians of color. I also want to highlight too, like, so in pri so I talk a lot, I've been talking a lot about my, my forensic work, but I have not highlighted my private practice work enough. And so I'm so grateful. I am really grateful for Melissa Carlson counseling. I'm so grateful for Melissa. I hope she watches this. Um, because I love that experience. I really do. And I love that like most of the clients that I got that I have are black and brown people right? There are people who look like me. There are people who talk like me. There's different cultural references that we get. And um, most of my referrals come from Therapy for Black Girls, right? And I love that I get a chance to work with clients who, um, I guess that we can almost relate to each other in that way, right? And so like, it's not, obviously therapy is not about me, they're paying me to provide a service, I get that. Um, but I, a lot of the feedback that I got, that I get from from clients that I work with is like their ability to just kind of just be themselves, you know what I mean? Like there's just certain things, there's hair stuff, there's just, you know, jokes that we get with each other um, that just adds a different um, layer of, rapport and safety and so I'm so grateful for those clients and to the experience of private practice because not only do I get to work with um black the other black people and brown people um but like I am working with people who are a lot like me right and so my forensic work is all men I work with all men all freaking day right for years and now I work with men and women who are similar to myself so it gives me a different experience and it just kind of lights me up for lack of better words i'm so corny <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it's been like so far all right very nice i'm happy to hear that speaking of that yeah. trainings all that other stuff private practices you are a very busy individual 
right? So let's talk yeah. about some of that other stuff that you are super busy with. So for those of you all that don't know, Chelsea does a lot of stuff that we're going to get into. So one of the first things that we're actually going to get into is her own business, Cadence. So what led you to want to start your own business? Um, so what led me to do to start Cadence was uh, was starting independent practice work. So I am a contract and contracted employee for, you know, Melissa Carlson. And so it's like, all right, cool. I got to look like make it legitimate, right? I got to have a business, you know, the, 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 that because I am technically an entrepreneur in that way. Um, and so I started an LLC. Um, my daughter's name is Kaden. And um, I thought about when coming up for the name of Cadence, I was wanting the kind of tagline to go with it is your rhythm, your, your flow, your cadence, right? And so cadence is just kind of like a steady rhythm of balance, just kind of keeping things kind of even keel. I'm also in a sorority and my sorority name is Harmonious Harmony. And so that's also kind of a synonym of cadence, right? And so I was like, all right, well, Harmony is not the cutest name for a business. And cadence is Caden, no, Cadence was, was sounded like what I wanted it to be. And then I spelled it with my daughter's name in it. And so that's how the name Cadence came about in terms of what I do with Cadence. And so right now Cadence is like a kind of, and we're still, I'm still in development with what I want to do. I think a lot of the things that I'm talking about are things that I currently do, but things that I want to do career wise. So like I do do some public speaking. Um, I obviously am, I do therapy. Um, outside of my W-2 um, with MCC, Melissa Carlson Counseling. Um, and then I'll probably do, like, I can pick up other contractual work through my business, right? And so all of those things are underneath Cadence. I also have an online platform where I'm always talking about mental health because clearly I'm a mental health nerd um, in the best way. <laughs> um, so if you follow me on social media, um, then you'll see, um, I'm not the best at posting myself. I'm working on it, but I post a lot of mental health resources. Like I just, and people really reach out and they're like, thank you so much for sharing this. I didn't realize this. You do a really good job of normalizing things. And that makes me feel really fulfilled just kind of hearing those things and just being able to share that with people who choose to follow me. And so I would say that Cadence is really a platform to promote mental health and wellness, specifically within the black and brown community. Um, what I, I literally work with everyone, um, but I really have a special place in my heart for um, Black people, young Black people, young adult Black people who are trying to figure themselves out, who are trying to manage boundaries, who are trying to figure out what this thing called anxiety is, who have some trauma, who might be dealing with depression and want to figure out how to um, have happier, healthier lifestyles. So that's what I do at Cadence. Stay tuned because more is coming. <laughs> <laughs> all right perfect i am happy to hear that all right so yeah. the next question was what led you to choose that name but she already answered that so to substitute that question i'm going to add on a question after this question don't worry it's a fun question i promise but i know you talked about this a little bit so are there any special projects that you're working on at cadence that you want people to know about yes yes and so um i am part of um I wouldn't say that it's necessarily under Cadence, but I guess what I do as Chelsea, um, things that I'm a part of as Chelsea. And so um, there's one, um, man, how many things am I involved in? My gosh. Um, so I have one called The Squad, and that is um, something that's very, very new. We launched it in 2023. Okay. And so The Squad consists of um, myself and three of my dearest, closest friends. Um, and we basically, it, we, you can call it a podcast, um, but we, um, but it's a little bit more in depth where, and where we, we, we meet live with, meet pe with people live and we have in-depth discussions about, um, various topics such as like, uh, mental health, um, physical health, journaling and spirituality, financial health. Um, and so we pick different topics and we kind of dive in from our respective, um, our respective like expertise. And then we also provide resources to our audience. And that the squad actually was born from a conference that we were all speakers at in October called I, the I Am Her Conference. Um, 
shout out to Dr. Sheila Hill, but with the I Am Her conference, we were all speaking about what it means for us to be her, right? What it, what does it mean for like me to embody the woman that my, my idealized version of myself, right? Because it's really about me and how I'm trying to be up here, right? How can I be a wealthy woman, mentally a, a wealthy woman? Because wealth is not just about like, oh, I've got a million or two million or a billion dollars, right? It's what is my mindset to maintain a wealthy, healthy, holistic lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how, right? Ooh, that was a nice little tagline, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but so it, the squad was born from that panel because the audience was like, and this was in person and we had a, a pretty big audience and they were like, we love you guys and we wish you could have been on more. Please do this again. And so then we, we brainstormed for a few months and we launched the squad and we've, we've had two events so far. And they've been really successful and they've been so much fun. Cause again, from my perspective, I'm educating people. We're reaching different people up, um, talking about our respective professions and we want people to um, to grow and stretch themselves. The next thing that I'm that I'm um, that I'm involved in is called women in wealth. And so rewinding a little bit, I talked about um, like being holistic, essentially like a wealthy woman. And so women in wealth is something that I've been an organization that I've been involved with for um, I don't know, man, maybe like six or so months. Um, and it is wonderful. And, you know, with women in wealth, it really, um, it's, we are the founding cohort. Um, and so again, shout, shouting out, um, Dr. Dr. Hill, um, as well as her partner, Kay, um, they're the founders of the one, the organization women in wealth, and they handpicked select women who were, um, leaders in the community to be a part of this organization where we focus on mentorship, we focus on volunteerism, we focus on finances, we focus on physical health, we focus on our mental health, right? We take all of these things, we meet monthly and we have different topics that we, we explore every month. Uh, we talk about our professionalism, our professional health and how we can grow professionally and how can we um, embody this wealthy mindset and become wealthy women and then once this cohort is finished, once we've wrapped up our year, then we get a chance to mentor other women. Mm -hmm. And we start to grow um, grow women in wealth and grow the wealthy woman, right? It's so cool. I'm so grateful for the things that I'm involved in. Um, I think that's it. I mean, I'm a mom too, so I'm a parent. <laughs> I do private practice. I got a W-2. I got the squad. I got women in wealth. And then I want to do a million other things. So I'm just, it's just like, I need to slow down. But I think that's all I'm involved in right now. I think so. Yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. Yeah. So before we get into the next one, I'm going to flip in that surprise question in there. I guess it's not really a surprise question because I know you mentioned you were a part of a sorority. So if you want, you can give them a shout out. Absolutely. So, I mean... If you're my sore, then you've probably already peeped it. I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, hence the pink, hence the pearls. Um, and so, yeah, so that is not something I'm as active in right now from like a, I'm doing something every weekend, but I've been a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha since 2011. So I began my journey in the sorority in undergrad and I'm so grateful because, so again, I guess kind of going, going, you know, I just presented on, um, on this book that I'm reading in one of my women in wealth meetings. Um, so the book is called the 15 measurable laws of growth. And the chapter that I presented on is the law of environment. And one of the things that stuck out to me the most in that book was the, um, the types of people that you want to surround yourself with, right? So there's the bottom 33%, the middle 33% and the top 33%, really it would be 34% from a math perspective, but whatever. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm the 1%, anyway. So the bottom, the bottom 33% is the people who would like suck the energy out of you. They're so negative. They're just Debbie Downers, right? I, and when, as I was presenting, I'm like, I think we can all probably think of one or two people in our lives who just feel like this. Like, oh goodness, here comes such and such, right? The middle 33% are those who are, um, are like when things are going good, it's great. We're having fun. You're my homegirl. You're my road dog, all that fun stuff. But when something happens, right, then they kind of absorb the energy and the stress of what's happened and they can they can become really negative and they can kind of pull people down with them right um and while those aren't none of these people i would none of these people i would characterize as good or bad um but 
that's, you know, that's just kind of how it is. And so the top 33% are those who are um, positive, who help you grow, who um, are those who maybe you can learn from, who can maybe help to stretch you. And when things go bad, they're not going to kind of throw a pity party with you and try to pull you down and collude with you. And, you know, like, oh, you should just go flash his tires. I don't know. That's the first thing I could think of. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Those are going to be the people who are like, all right, cool. Let's take a step back and let's let's evaluate and figure out what's going on, right? I recognize that you're feeling hurt. I recognize that that was a really tough time. Let's find a way to progress through this, right? As an example, I'm grateful that the people in my life, I characterize in that, that top 33%. So that encompasses my sorority sister. That encompasses my, my squad. That encompasses the women in wealth um, and, um, community that I have my personal friendships, my colleagues. I'm very, very grateful for all of these people that I have around me who I consider to be in the top 32%. I wouldn't be able, I don't think I would be as successful as I, as I am if I didn't have the, the, um, the village around me that I have, you know? Mm -hmm. well, perfect. Shout out to AKA, right? Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. All right, perfect. All right, so then going back to the squad, right? I know you mentioned that you were a part of them. You guys have in-depth conversations and you bring your expertise when you have those conversations. So if we can go just a little bit more in depth with it, what is your personal role within the squad? What do you do for that group or within that group? Excellent. So let me actually give you an example because so we just had an event today, is Sunday. We had an event on, a, on Friday, so a couple of days ago. Um, and the event is called, what's called, is it me, am I the problem? And what we did was we based our conversation um, from, sometimes we tend to ask ourselves in various settings, like, is it me? Like, did I do something wrong? Am I the reason why this stuff is going on? Like, am I the reason why this relationship failed? Am I the reason why my finances aren't where, you know, where they need to be? So what, what I do is I like to allow I try to I try to model I did a lot of modeling I think in that in that meeting um modeling how I've in my own personal therapy journey one of the first things and the hardest things that I had to do was take a look at myself I always characterize therapy as like somebody holding up a mirror and you got to look at yourself in your rawest form and you kind of have to deal with your stuff and that can feel really hard and that can sometimes make you feel like you want to shut down like you want to internalize or personalize and blame yourself and, you know, negative self-talk yourself to, to pieces. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I provided like an outline of like how sometimes I had to recognize how I was the problem. And that doesn't make me a bad person. That doesn't make me wrong. I had to learn how to also recognize my role in different dynamics and different areas where I needed growth and how to give myself grace in that process. Right. Um, and I guess one of my, I guess, therapy philosophies, what I try to bring into like the therapy session with my clients is like self-compassion. Like, how can you be nice to yourself? Like, what are you saying to yourself that is contributing to how you feel? Right. And so if you're just being mean and, you know, shouldn't on yourself all day and, you know, like, oh, I'm so this and I'm so that and not a positive way, then that's probably going to impact your mood. It's probably going to impact your behavior probably going to impact your interpersonal dynamics with the people around you. Um, and so I did that. I did a lot of modeling and I tried to kind of utilize that lens in providing examples and maybe some teaching points. Um, we also provided our, our audience with a resource, right? And so the resource was, um, it was like a, like a, it was like a booklet of different things. And so my portion of the booklet was providing um, education about mental health, how to find a therapist, um, what are some things to consider when looking for a therapist? Because it can feel super duper overwhelming to try to find a therapist. Um, and then also, shucks, what else was in it? It was how to find a therapist, um, what are, like how to recognize like anxiety, depression, some stress. Um, I gave some skills on like what to do if you're experiencing really big emotions. Um, specifically, I talked about the power of breath. And also, I wanted also people to, get a little bit of understanding of like why breath is important right oftentimes you're like okay let's just do some breathing let's just breathe it out and a lot of people are like that doesn't work for me right that doesn't work 
but understanding like the science behind right the evidence mm -hmm. to support why breath is important may help people to just give it a shot right and sometimes i have to practice like well maybe it doesn't work and then i engage in a deep breathing exercise and i recognize i feel so different mm -hmm. so yeah that's part that's part of my role in the squad that's what i that's what i had the opportunity to do last this past friday and it was fun all right, nice and true. So true about the breathing, especially when I have clients that say, oh, breathing doesn't work for me. I've been doing this so forever. And I say, okay, how do you breathe? And they do, I'm just like, that's not how you do it. Exactly. <laughs> right, so. Exactly. Oh man, takes me back. <laughs> but more specifically, now that we talked a little bit about the squad, right? Let's talk a little bit about women in wealth. So I know you talked about them a little bit, but how did you get involved with Women in Wealth and what specifically do you do for them? Absolutely. So I was, like I mentioned earlier, I was hand-selected um, to be in Women in Wealth. And so the founders, um, Dr. Sheila Hill and Ann Kay are actually people who I know personally. Um, I've known Kay my entire life, mostly. Um, and I've also known Dr. Hill for most of my life. Um, and she is a force. They both are, both are a force. Um, and so I was hand-selected. I knew nothing about it. Um, even though I have a personal relationship with Kay, she's just like, you don't want to miss this out, miss out. Because if you miss out, you're going to be wishing you were involved. And I'm like, all right, I got to make, a, I got to figure this out. I got to figure out how to get involved. Um, and that, and my involvement has required sacrifice um, because I don't live in Rockford. Um, I live um, in the Chicagoland area. And so it requires me to sacrifice Saturdays and move around my schedule move around my work schedule to be present for our meetings every week. Um, it requires sacrifice, uh, and I'm kind of getting into the weeds of like what we do. It requires sacrificing for me to get up um, by weekly mornings because we have about accountability calls and we hold each other accountable. And so that's another thing that I love about Women in Wealth is we have an accountability partner as a collective. We are holding each other accountable. Like if one person is failing, we're all failing. So we need to be working to make sure that we're all operating collectively um, as a force moving forward and progressing forward. Um, I've had opportunity to, um, through mentorship also, because so as I mentioned, like I'm going to eventually become a mentor, but right now I'm being mentored by one of the founders of the organization. And so when I'm mentorship sessions, we're taking a deep dive into some of the things that are hindering me professionally, that are hindering me personally, that it hindered me health-wise, and how can I maybe do better or how can I pivot some things, <clears throat> excuse me, pivot some things or maybe change my mindset mm -hmm. so I can excel in those things, right? I'm not, and I'm not aiming to be perfect, but I do recognize that there are some deficits. And if I tweak some things a little bit, I'd probably be a lot less stressed or probably feel a little bit healthier, feel a little bit more jolly. Um, we also have a gala coming up. And so mm -hmm. One of the most recent things that we've been doing is we as a collective, and the collective is the group of women um, who are in the founding cohort of Women and Wealth, we are planning the, the gala. And so we are, I'm on a sponsorship committee. Um, and so I am myself and a group of other women are um, reaching out to different organi organizations, talking to them about what we, who we are, what we stand for and what our gala is about. Um, and we're asking, you know, different organizations, you know, if they're interested in sponsoring us um, and sponsoring the event. Um, and so that's all coming together at this moment at the end of March, March 31st, 2023 um, at 6 p.m. <laughs> um, um, you know, we'll have our gala and it's basically honoring um, all of the women who put in this work to bring everyone here. Um, and then also honoring the founders because they're amazing, right? We also have a guest speaker um, and that's going to be amazing. Um, and so that's essentially what Women in Wealth is. That's essentially what I do each week. We have speakers who come in and speak to us. Um, like I said, we, I presented on a chapter on the law of environment because it's a lot of, the, a lot of our meeting center around how are we growing? How are we stretching ourselves? And I'm putting ourselves in positions that maybe feel uncomfortable or different or new um, so that we can grow. Right. And how are we supporting each other through that growth? So, yeah. It's really awesome. I'm very grateful. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Course, shameless plug in there. March 31st at 6 p.m. Yep. Yep. In Rockford, Illinois at the Tabala um, Event Center. 
So please reach out if you're interested in buying tickets or would like to sponsor. I'm your girl. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there you go. All right, that's what these interviews are all about. There you go. <laughs> you know, if you guys are interested, don't worry, we're going to have a question at the end to show how you can get in contact with her. Okay. All right, so then next up, because unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, we're down to our final four questions. Oh, oh wow. wow. This is flown by. This is fun. Mm -hmm. All right. So my next question is, because I know you mentioned this a little bit, but how did you get involved and what is your process for getting involved with public speaking? Where did public speaking start? That is a really excellent question. Honestly, I think it started with teaching the class in grad school, the career planning and career exploration. Um, I just remember that like, oh, I'm kind of good at this. When I allow myself to be myself and I get over the jitters and the imposter syndrome, I think I can be good at this. I think I have a, I do a good job at like engaging people um, and relating to people. I think my, and so that was way back in 2014, maybe 15. Um, but I don't think I had my first real like public speaking engagement until 2020 or 2021. Um, and it was virtual. Um, and I spoke at a high school for, for high school students, me and a colleague of mine, and we spoke on systematic, systemic um, racism. Um, and we talked about like different tools and skills and we talked to the students and it was really cool. And me and um, that colleague of mine were sought out for that. All the speaking engagements that I've done has not been like, all right, let me go look. Like people have just reached out like, hey, would you like to speak at this? Which is pretty cool. And the next one was, um, uh, I think it was called Women in Wellness Conference. Um, and the, the founder of this conference is also a soror of mine, Bria. Um, and she reached out to me. She only met on the internet and she was just like, you have a great online presence and I would love for you to be a speaker, a panelist. And so I got a chance to speak with other really dynamic women. Um, I got a chance to speak um, um, at a church, um, focusing on like how we, you can merge mental health and spirituality and religion and within the church, the two don't have to exist separately. That one was really cool. And I ended up speaking for like two hours. Um, and then I did the panel um, back in October and I may have done a couple of other things as well. Um, but you know, the opportunities that I've had thus far, I've been grateful enough to just know people and they're like, Hey, you're a mental health therapist. You have a wealth of knowledge. Can you please come talk to, to people and share your perspective? Um, and so I, my goal is to be a little bit more intentional about that as time progresses and like host workshops or, you know, partner with businesses and educate business, you know, their staff on you know various topics and whatever they need so but yeah it's been really it's been a cool experience All right. very nice and definitely businesses do need that stuff so there is Heard. a gold mine of business out there at those businesses mm -hmm. crazy pun but i mean i don't make the stuff up just comes naturally mm -hmm. naturally <laughs> All right, but now that we get into our final three questions, because again, all my good things must come to an end. So is there anything that you'd like to tell people that are either starting out in the field or have been in the field for a while? <clears throat> so for people starting out, hmm. yes, there is something. I laugh because I, I, I hope it's not an unpopular opinion, but it's mine. Um, you do not have to um, take on the mindset or the comment that you may hear that we're in this for the people and not the money. Yes, we're obviously in this field, in this pro profession for the people because we, we do some hard work and you, I could be a billionaire and I can still feel like fatigued or, you know, I mean, I'm still going to give it my all for the people that I work with. Right. Um, but I think we work really hard for the degrees that we have and for the training that we have. And you can make money in this field. I promise you, you can. It might look a little bit different than what you may be getting taught in your classes um, or that you've been taught with your classes in your classes, but you certainly can make 
of a decent living and you can live a really nice, healthy lifestyle, a financially healthy lifestyle in the field of mental health. Yeah. I wish, I wish, I wish somebody would have had that conversation with me. I also wish that I knew more about business um, because yeah. yes, this is a people game. We don't know enough about business in my opinion. Yeah, that's true. That is 100% true. Great unpopular opinion. Who knows? It might be popular or more popular than you think. Who knows? <laughs> I'd love to have some conversations with people about it. I, man, that'd be great. And then second to last question, unless you're going to say something else. Yep. You know what? How the, the people who've been in the field for a while, I didn't answer that. I didn't answer that question. Oh, so okay. what would I say to the people who've been in the field for a while? Um, I would say, I kind of phrase it, I hope it doesn't sound silly, but like find your tribe. Find those people who, um, and it doesn't have to be many people, but maybe one or two other clinicians who you can just kind of decompress with um, and maybe talk about like, maybe check perceptions with each other. It's a very, it can feel like a very isolating experience to be a black clinician. Um, it can feel, sometimes you may, we sometimes we gaslight ourselves and we convince ourselves that um, what we just experienced isn't accurate because we don't have anybody around us to validate it or to even just like say like, hey, like, did you experience this thing? Am I, am I tripping? You know what I mean? And we can't, it's not like we can go home and talk to our family or significant other whomever about it because, you know, HIPAA. Um, and while we may be able to kind of vaguely kind of describe our work experience, it's nothing like kind of being a Black clinician and to, not really feeling like validated in your work environment or maybe even, you know, I, I, one thing that I've experienced is like, sometimes I don't feel like my clients, my black clients always are heard or understood. And I find myself sometimes advocating a little bit harder for those clients for a little bit more cultural competence, because you have to look at everybody holistically. You can't just look at their current behavior. You've got to take a look at like their cultural background, their upbringing, their respective trauma, if they have trauma, right? Um, that is specific related, specifically related to the Black experience, right? Mm -hmm. So find a person, find a tribe, join a networking group, um, shameless plug. One thing that really helped me um, is sometimes Facebook groups. I'm not the most active on Facebook groups, but I'm in one called Clinicians of Color in Private Practice. You heard of that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think people share some really good information on there. Um, if you're having an experience where like, I just wish I could connect with people, you know, you, there might be other clinicians in the, your respective area that you don't even know are there. And you could just like, hey, I want to meet up and meet people. So yeah, that'd be my advice for people in the field now. Yeah, perfect, great advice. Yeah. Great advice. I mean, that's true. I'm not gonna get on my soapbox about that either, but just to say a yeah. little bit about that, I mean, it is an unpopular opinion, especially starting out in school, because it's like you shouldn't be in this for the money because you're not going to make a lot of money. But thankfully, as time progressed and as I surround myself with other professionals, they're like, you know, of course, they would have to be us. Here's how you make money. Do this if you want to be successful. And I took that and I ran with it. There we go. As you should. As you should. And I wish more people would, right? Because we can. And we deserve that. We work really freaking hard. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll both get in the soapbox. I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hopefully don't get too far off your soapbox for this next question. All right. So second to last question before it gets to the most important one. Is there anything that you would like to say that I haven't had a chance to ask you? Um, well, you know, maybe we can talk about self-care. I think self-care is pretty important and recognizing the importance of boundaries. Um, because that's one thing. So I'm not saying that I'm a money hungry therapist, but I do enjoy a, a certain lifestyle, right? Um, I, I, I like nice things. I like Starbucks. Um, and, but so in order to be able to afford nice things, you know, you got to work. Um, and so I have to be careful that I'm not pushing myself too hard, whether it's with, and it's with everything that I'm involved in, right? My extracurriculars, my volunteer, um, my um, my W-2, my, uh, my private practice, parenting, like just everything. And so I have to be vigilant of when 
I am physically starting to recognize signs of burnout and knowing when to be in a space where I'm where I need to walk away and that doesn't mean like I'm walking away person like um, permanently like peace out forever but it's like I know I need to take time off like I need to take this Friday off I need to completely just do nothing I need to not think for like a week about other people's stuff um and I think it's important to feel to be in an environment where you feel safe enough to do that right so that's if you choose to be in a w-2 job which is a you know, place where you get a paycheck and they take out taxes and all that jazz. Um, if you choose to do that, like, it's my hope that you feel safe enough to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And that your employer, supervisor, whomever, respects your burnout and your boundaries enough to be like, okay, cool, we'll figure it out. And so you can operate the best that you can. Because if we're not, if we're not taking care of ourselves, then we're not able to take care of our clients. Um, and I sometimes have to give myself that pep talk when I've got a full day and I'm tired or didn't sleep well, or maybe I've got another stressor going on. Um, I need to make sure that I'm really intentional about my time. So instead of like, so Fridays are usually my busiest day. I'm in section from like 8.30 a.m. to like four, from, yeah, like four-ish. And sometimes if I have no cancellations, I'll have a one hour break. I could do notes. <laughs> I could do notes on my one hour break. Um, but oftentimes I choose to eat and I choose to take a 30 minute nap so I can get through the rest of the day. Um, and that, ooh, when I tell you that 30 minute nap is like, it really helps me show up for people because I don't know how I would be able to do a straight day without that. And so I, the, part, of, part of what I'm saying too is like, I have to know like what my boundaries are. I know I, if I don't get a, if I don't get a break in the day, I'm going to be no good for the second half of my day. So I had to build in a lunch time for myself. Um, and I know I can't see more than like seven clients in a day. Like that seven is, whew, that's a lot. And it may not sound like a lot, but my other clinicians know, like you're literally kind of pouring into people all day and, it, and you're switching kind of stories and that can be me mentally taxing. And so just know your own boundaries. If you don't know what they are, start to, start to pay attention to like what you're feeling throughout the day. Um, what you're feeling like, how you're interacting with people. Are you irritable? Are you able to turn things off at the end of the day? Um, do you need to find a way to decompress and separate the day, especially for my work from home people? For me, my separation is um, closing the computer and I take a shower. Um, and for some reason, and I wash my face. And for some reason, that's just, I'm no longer at work. I'm no longer work Chelsea. And I'm like, Chelsea, who's gonna eat dinner and probably watch Bluey with my, with my daughter. Bluey's the best show ever um and I don't know probably read a book until I go to bed so yeah I, I think that's one thing we didn't get a chance to touch on much but we all as clinicians just need to be really mindful of um because sometimes it'll sneak up on you without even without you really noticing it yeah definitely 100% yeah. agree do not burn yourself out take care of yourself 30 minute naps are amazing Jeez. so good mm -hmm. I did a 10 minute nap last week and I was I was on it those are better than the long naps but I won't I won't go into that but yeah we're good all right so then the last and most important question of the day right where can people contact you if they have any questions or want to connect yes so um if you would like to connect with me there's a couple ways you can um you can email me uh, my email address is c k e t t o n lcpc at gmail.com so that's c keaton at lcpc at gmail.com um you can also follow me on social media um, my instagram handle is your cadence and that's spelled y-o-u-r and cadence is spelled uniquely c-a-i-d-e-n-c-e -E. so y-o-u-r-c-a-i-d-e-n-c-e -E. I, -E. I think i spelled that wrong the first time so your cadence um, and then on Facebook, it is just Cadence, so C-A-I-D-E-N-C-E. -E. You can follow me on there. You'll see me talk about mental health. I'll share a lot of mental health. I'd love for you to engage with me. If you have any questions or would like to work with me, honestly, um, feel free to reach out to me and we can chat. All right, perfect. You hear it here, folks? She is open and ready to chat with you all.
All right. Other than that, then that is about it for this interview. We're going to definitely have to have you back on for part two because we need to get into a lot more stuff we didn't have enough time to talk about today. I'm down for it. This was super fun. I love these types of things. All right. Perfect. All right, everybody. This is Corsair Mack, president of the Illinois Mental Health Council Association, signing out. And I'll see you in the next interview. Take care.